Hello there, this is Mark Bauerlein for another conversation here at First Things. Today we have with us Heather McDonald, whose name is probably familiar to many listeners out there. She is a prominent author and opinion columnist, essayist in magazines such as National Review, The Weekly Standard. She's written for us here at First Things. Uh, she is a fellow, at the senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, she has become quite prominent recently for a book that came out entitled The War on Cops that happened to just precede the acts uh, of violence, actually, against police officers in the wake of uh, Ferguson and the riots in Baltimore. In fact, Heather is responsible for coining the term, the Ferguson effect, that even, uh, even the FBI uh, came to adopt. And I'll, I might ask her about the Ferguson effect, but one of the things that struck me when I was reading the book, The War on Cops, is that when Heather would discuss these different cases of, of crime and alleged, uh, alleged brutality on the part of the police officers, how often the people involved were young men, as Heather noted, with no fathers in the home. And that this family theme uh, was a, a common one in many of the episodes that she investigated. So we'll, we'll get into those things, but first, Heather, welcome. This is such an honor, Mark. Thank you so much for having me on. Good, good. Well, I think that's, that's probably maybe the first thing that I will ask. You have been covering the crime issue for several years and are acknowledged as one of the leading public commentators on, on issues of race and crime and, and the inner cities. We don't hear very much about that fact that you highlighted, the fatherlessness of so many of these young, young men who get in trouble with the police. Why is that? Well, first I want to say it is a catastrophe. It's a civilizational catastrophe the breakdown of the family in this country, and it is particularly uh, dangerous and tragic within the black community where the out of wedlock birth rate nationally now is 70%. And if you go to inner city areas, whether it's in Milwaukee or the south side of Chicago, you're likely to see about an 85% out of wedlock birth rate. Uh, when Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote his present analysis of the civil rights movement and what he was concerned about was were we going to be able to continue making progress in equality and bridging the gap between the races and he said with black family breakdown that is going to serve as a check despite our best intentions at that point the black out of wedlock birth rate was 26 percent and he was right then, and he would be even more right now to say 70%. Why don't we talk about this? I believe primarily it's because of the power of radical feminism, that it is taboo in our culture to say that males matter. The reigning conceit is that strong women can do it all. and. Uh, we have also become a culture of non-judgmentalism for perhaps understandable reasons. Literature is filled with stories of fallen women, single women who are cast out of their community and bear the opprobrium of an out-of-wedlock birth. And those individual cases were seen by authors as tragic. And so now we are very reluctant uh, to say anything critical about people's behavioral choices. We want to accept all, all decisions that people make as equally valid. But in our rush to not be judgmental towards what is in fact an extraordinarily antisocial decision, which is to have children without the intention to marry the father, and that goes as well, of course, for fathers who increasingly now are spawning children by multiple females 
with whom they have no intention to marry, our, our unwillingness to condemn that behavior um, means that there's no check on it. And the consequences, as you say, uh, are most worrisome in the massive uh, racial crime disparities and the blacks in this country are murdered at six times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. That is a civil rights abomination. And the reason for that elevated rate of homicide victimization is the fact that blacks commit homicide at eight times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined and 11 times the rate of whites alone. And I think I agree with you that the most important factor in understanding this mindless inner city violence is the fact that so many children and males in particular are growing up without a father. Indeed. Last month I taught the Scarlet Letter. Exactly. And I, 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 I could, I could just see on their faces that there is nothing farther from the world they live in than this Puritan community <laughs> in the 17th century and the judgmentalism yeah. uh, that goes on there. What's the big deal? Right. I mean, come on, she was lonely. Uh, you know, they, they, she and Dimsdale, they cared about each other. Okay, okay. Uh, but you know, that failure to, to understand the fatherhood side of things or the radical feminism that uh, holds up the strong mother is good enough. That, that came clear to me when, during the Baltimore riots, there was a little video of a woman who found her 14, I think 14 or 15 year old son on the street and she went after him. What are you doing? You know, the F or the horrible language. Get your head off here. And she smacks him a few times and drags him. She was turned into a hero. Even, even in the conservative media, she was made into a hero. And I, I had to agree. I appreciate this woman. She's trying, the, the rage and exasperation is very understandable. And she's trying to get control of her 14 year old son who's out on the streets at 11 o'clock at night. But Heather, you, tell, me, tell me if I'm wrong in my supposition here. I added to that, one, why are you talking to your son this way? Why are you cussing him out right in public in front of everyone? I can imagine this, 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 this young guy is going to get teased mercilessly in, in, in subsequent days and weeks. And I'll, where is the father? Where is the father? This, it, it is very difficult for a 16-year-old boy to be disciplined, to be smacked by his mother. You know, with the father, the father punishes you. When you acknowledge you've done something wrong, you get through that by, you get through the whatever humiliation you feel by identifying with the father. He's doing the right thing for me. And I, you, you, you begin to put yourself in, into his perspective. It's very hard for, for the boy to do if there's the mother. I mean, there was a reason the mother would say, wait till your father gets home. Is this... Am, am, am I correct <laughs> on, on, on this? Absolutely. And uh, obviously there are individual differences. There are females that are more male-like in their raising of children and fathers that are the pushover and, and they're the source of unbounded compassion and forgiveness. Uh, but, you know, one of the big fallacies of the left-wing liberal ideology is to insist that differences between males and females are socially constructed. Uh, at the same time that females are demanding all sorts of privileges and quotas on the basis that, well, you've got to have a female there because apparently there's something essentially different about her. But when it comes to acknowledging the unique and complementary roles of a father in raising a child, that's all just out the window. And, and they, they believe everything is interchangeable and males are an afterthought. Uh, the tragic thing is, is that the kids themselves 
understand this. I talk in the book about uh, an analysis that the Alice Goffman, a left-wing sociologist, the daughter of Irving Goffman, did of a crack-selling community in Philadelphia. And she profiles a family of, of young criminals who are raised by a single crack-addicted mother. They all have different fathers. And th the older son, uh, who is only a crack dealer, who occasionally uses uh, gun violence to deal with his uh, rivals, he explains his younger son, his younger brother, Reggie, who the mother describes as, with pride as a stone-cold gangster and who engages routinely in armed robberies, which is viewed as a more egregious uh, form of, of crime and violence. He explains the difference between himself, who is a upstanding crack dealer versus <laughs> Reggie, as the fact that his father came around sometimes when he was growing up, whereas Reggie's father was just completely gone. So here's a boy with his own insight into the fact, now obviously his, his scale of, of moral <laughs> rectitude is not one that we would recognize, but he understands that having your father there provides something that the single mother cannot. I would like to see some study, perhaps there are studies done, of the rates of, let's just say, misogynistic attitudes among, among young men who are raised with fathers in the home or without fathers in the home. I mean, if you look at rap music, the, the profound misogyny and anger and, and wrath that you find toward women in, in those songs. I wonder if, if, if those young men had had a 35-year-old father in the home who was stable, whom he saw relating to his mother in a, in a responsible way, if those songs would have the appeals that they, that they do have. Interesting. Um, yes, I've, I've not thought about that, um, but, but certainly, you know, there, there is no rhetoric there of of supporting the, the two-parent unit and what you've got now. And it's not just, the problem here is not just the individual case of that male growing up without his own father. It's that when the culture no longer assumes marriage as the norm, and it bec what becomes the norm is what is known in a sterile fashion in the sociology literature as multi-partner fertility, right. which is the chaos of any given mother having children by several different fathers and any given male having children by several different mothers. So even if there was to be some kind of hallelujah moment where people say, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marry, who do you marry? But when the, that becomes the norm and the expectation is, is that young males can freely impregnate girls without any expectation of marriage, they have no necessity for civilizing some of the worst impulses in males. I mean, I, I am not anti-male, but one has to acknowledge that there is uh, a higher level of aggression of a testosterone and a desire, if possible, uh, to just be maximally f fertile and, and not take on those responsibilities of mm -hmm. learning deferred gratification. The, the cultural script that previously assumed that if you want to be able to uh, have to enjoy long-term yeah. intercourse, right, <laughs> you either are going to go to a brothel or you are going to make yourself a attractive potential spouse. And that, that script means that boys have to look towards the future, develop skills to make themselves breadwinners, uh, and, and learn to control their, their worst 
reckless impulses. When that is taken away and boys have no expectation of becoming marriageable mates, then you've got as well another reason for a level of violence and brutality in, in these inner city areas that is most people would have a hard time fathoming. You're going to have to build more prisons for the young men, and you're going to have to create more state programs to support the women right. because the men aren't doing it any, any, any more. Indeed, you know, President Obama, he gave a commencement address at Morehouse College, and he talked about the importance of being men, husbands, and fathers. He's clearly aware of this. Mm -hmm. When the Baltimore riots broke out, it was all lack of access, lack of opportunity, not one word about the necessity of fathers, of stable families. I mean, it was, it was like it was 1971, back all, all, all over again. It was the most stale explanation for, for that tumult. And I, I think I even said to Midge Dector, who was up here, I said, Midge, well, you know, why, why, why is Obama, you know, talking about this? I mean, I mean, why not? And she said, don't you think he knows, of course, what the real problem is? And I said, well, why not take it? Why, why, why not talk about it? She says, can't do it. Mm -hmm. Just can't do it. Well, he's a typical product of our academic culture, uh, highly educated, obviously, and that culture is now 100% dedicated to cultivating racial victimology. And that means inevitably blaming the alleged white oppressive patriarchy uh, and, and systemic racism for all problems that blacks face. So, and of course he knew, I mean, he gave another speech as he was running for president the first time in 2008 on Father's Day in Chicago, where he also, he spoke about the statistics uh, that children growing up in single parent families are multiply times more likely to be poor, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the least of their problems. The more serious is dropping out of school, becoming teen mothers, getting involved in gangs, crime, ending up in prison, as you say. And yet, even in that speech, he concluded with the usual democratic genuflection before an expanded social service welfare state. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he chose to throw in his lot, as he has, uh, with the absolutely stale, as you say, democratic thinking, which is to never talk about behavioral choices and personal responsibility. You, you mentioned him as a product of academia. I remember watching George Will give a lecture, and he didn't refer to President Obama. He referred to Professor Obama. He said, Professor Obama, our second professor president, after Woodrow Wilson, of, of, of course. But I don't think a lot of people who aren't part of academia, especially the, the research world, know how strong the, the, the female side has become. For instance, in my field of English, in the humanities, 70% of the PhDs for many years now have gone to women, not to men. Of course, the undergraduate population is now about 60% female uh, to male. Uh, the talk, though, the patriarchal talk, continues because of the STEM areas, which actually doesn't apply to all the STEM areas. Medical school is now 50-50, male, female. More women went to law school last year than, went, than, than, than men did. And yet, the, the more, well, what I found is, the more women come in and gain as a proportion, the more talk about the patriarchy there is in, in, in higher education. And so it doesn't surprise, doesn't surprise me, yes, yeah, Professor Obama is, is very much, and he's very smooth in the way he can sort of hold a meeting as if he were leading a, a, a graduate seminar uh, on these issues. Well, the monomaniacal dominance of feminism and its utter unreality uh, is, is proven by what you're saying, Mark. Uh, 
the problem group in our society now is males, and yet you go to the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Education Department under President Obama, and I hope that President Trump will end this, but things are hard to turn around. All of the grant making is for females. It's you know, Chicanas in the stem cells or role models for females. As you say, females are the vast majority in colleges. Males are disappearing except for the stem cells and they are under, uh, in retreat there as well because there's not a single academic department in the hard sciences that is not under relentless pressure from the female bureaucracy and the massive diversity bureaucracy to hire by gender and to accept mediocre female candidates uh, in lieu of what the department has chosen through a, a meritocratic faculty search to be the best candidates. It's very terrifying. We are going to put our scientific competitive edge at risk by this crusade uh, to subject our stem cells to the same completely fallacious identity politics as, as has already destroyed the rest of the university. You, you did an article maybe about two years ago when the UC system was in a severe financial crunch on the bureaucratic structure of diversity. Was it at UCSD? Yes. 13 diversity deans of some kind, and you, you went through the hiring process for a new dean of inclusion and diversity. Hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on this. Was it the, was it the moving allowance was $65,000? Some, some, some extraordinary uh, amount, uh, and, and the, it, it, it really counts as a, a hard line ideology mm -hmm. now, the yeah. diversity uh, factor, as if the university itself is filled with pockets of resistance. People who refuse to, to admit uh, women and, and people of color. And to me, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's, it's become almost a pathological situation where the more progress is made, I mean, in terms of numbers, uh, which really is sort of their definition of progress, just demographic numbers, the, the more strident the rhetoric has become. Well, the expansion of the diversity bureaucracy is one of the greatest scandals in universities. And what I find always just so puzzling is in the, all the discourse about rising tuition, universities and colleges are held completely harmless. Tuition is treated as some sort of naturally occurring phenomenon. And to the extent we talk about it, it's the answer is always more federal loans. N nobody ever goes to the universities and say, but you are the ones that are causing this tuition rise. Explain yourselves. And if they were to do so, a huge ex part of that is this expanding diversity bureaucracy, which is devoted to a lie. And the lie is that universities are, are infected by the same systemic racism that we hear about in the criminal justice system, which is just as much of a lie, and that somehow qu competitively qualified female and minority faculty candidates are being discriminated against. Anybody who has sat through a faculty <laughs> search committee knows that the opposite reality is the case, that Every faculty search is one desperate lunge to compete for the finite number of competitively qualified minority candidates overall and in the STEM fields, female candidates. Uh, the numbers that are spent on this, most recently I've, I've not seen this before. This, that now we have reached a new, a new low in the insane diversity bureaucracy, bureaucratization of colleges. UCLA, part of the University of California system, part of the allegedly tin cup, you know, oh, California taxpayers are so stingy and they're not supporting higher education enough. 
UCLA has a vice chancellor of equity and diversity and inclusion who makes $444,000 a year. That is multiples nice. of the average faculty salary. So you got this Jerry Kang, who was a law professor and is one of the proponents of this phony implicit bias concept, presiding over every academic department, hounding them. But the engineering school at UCLA just created its own diversity dean. I'm not aware now, I think this is a first. It's certainly a first in the STEM fields for a academic department to have its internal diversity dean. And I tried to find out what his salary is going to be. Of course, I got no response from UCLA. But the costs mount, and if you want to understand why tuitions are going up in public and private schools, look no further than the diversity bureaucracy, which again is founded on a patent lie. You just wrote about this at City Journal. And I should tell our listeners, you can look up a lot of Heather's writings at, at City Journal uh, online. We'll be able to find out what that salary is as soon as, uh, right. as you know, when, when the year's numbers come out because these are, these are uh, public employees. Uh, but it is, it, it is extraordinary, the enormous resources. I mean, if, if someone's making $450,000, that doesn't include benefits, that doesn't include health care, that doesn't include the pension uh, side of things. And his staff. I mean, the, the diversity staffs, you know, Berkeley's diversity and equity and inclusion vice chancellor, who makes uh, like 265000 285000 his staff started out at 16, and within about two years, it had gone up to 25. It just gets larger and larger and larger. And, and what they're doing is telling minority students, Berkeley's campus is hung through with banners with the usual diversity bromides uh, about, they've got somebody from the health service saying, I will be a brave and sympathetic ally, <laughs> as if the Berkeley campus is a state of war and that these poor beleaguered minority students need allies really to survive. And another banner shows a, a Hispanic and a, and, a, and a black female student saying, allow others than yourself to exist. This is not hyperbole. They mean this. And he Heather, then people wonder when these students go out and protest, disrupt speakers, go mar march into classrooms and, and start chanting slogans, you wonder? Did, did you really think that this wasn't going to happen? Of course. You have been preparing them to do this. And this actually happened to you in, in California. You were the object of a, of a, of a protest that, uh, well, do, do you want to describe what happened? Well, at Claremont McKenna College in, in Southern California, I was invited to, uh, by the administration actually, because they were aware that their policing series had been very heavily left-wing, to talk about uh, the issue of policing in my book, The War on Cops. Uh, they got wind a couple days before of a protest planned. I was told that they were looking for a room that would have fewer plate glass windows and better means of egress, which was not reassuring. <laughs> uh, but they decided to hold it, after all, in what they call the Athenaeum, which is a large auditorium with, with again, plate glass windows to the outside. But uh, by the time I arrived, uh, things were already looking ugly enough that I was escorted into what was in essence a safe, a safe house where I could hear the chanting grow louder and louder. I couldn't really see it. And frankly, I don't want to become maudlin or, or self-pitying, mm. but it did feel a little bit like, you know, the French Revolution. You know, you hear the mob <laughs> outside or, or Emperor Jones because there was drumming. Uh, but the the crowd blockaded the building, 300 students or so, made mincemeat of the police. The police in the Black Lives Matter era are completely emasculated, so they let the students take control. And so nobody was able to get inside to hear my talk. Uh, I, I, I gave a talk to almost an empty room. It was live streamed. There were law enforcement people inside. Uh, and eventually they decided they couldn't guarantee my safety any longer because people were pounding on the plate glass windows and screaming so loudly. So I was 
escorted out through the kitchen and, and put into a waiting Claremont police car and taken to the police station. Whew. But there is a codependency. This, as, as you say, Mark, it is completely predictable by the racial victimology ideology that students being being fed. But there is a codependency between these narcissistic delusional students and the diversity bureaucracy. The students regularly act out little psychodramas of oppression before a appreciative audience of diversity bureaucrats. And the students are smart enough every time they issue a set of self-pitying demands claiming their victimization to They'll ask get for more diversity bureaucrats. <laughs> They always ask for a bigger diversity bureaucracy. And so, of course, the diversity bureaucracy is going to encourage this sort of thing because it's in its self-interest. You know, you know, Heather, I, I, I don't know, but I have to assume that young people who grow up in, you know, a stable household, you know, it has, it might have its dysfunctions here and there, but you've got the complementarity of, of, of a two-parent household, and they, they've managed to compile a strong enough academic record, and uh, when they're in high school, their parents might have read to them when, when, they, were, when they were little, so they've got some of, the, some, some of the intellectual aptitude to go to college that they're not going to be drawn to the grievance motives. They're not going to care about the, the psychodramas uh, going on with, with these other students. They, they tend to just want to keep their heads down, study hard, and head off to medical school or whatever, professional business school, whatever. I, but I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine someone growing up in a, in a sane household who, who, who can be so, uh, so vulnerable to absorbing the resentment and the grievance when they're obviously living a, a pretty nice existence. I mean, Claremont is an expensive school. It's a private school. It's a selective institution. It's nice up there. I've been up there on campus. I've spoken there before. It's a nice little town, nice little campus. What in the world do you guys have to complain about? And so this has to be fantastical on their part. What makes them so, so liable to absorbing this against all the evidence right, right in front of them? Well, I think there's two groups here. If you're talking about the white students versus the minorities who are the target of the racial victimology and are being told that they are the ones that are the victims, for the white students, I've, I, for one, was susceptible to liberal guilt growing up, and I think that young people, unfortunately, uh, do have uh, sort of a excessive moral zeal, want to feel that they are engaged in a moral crusade and that they are the first people in human history to recognize injustice. And uh, the narrative of, of unfairness, inequality, is very easy to pick up. I mean, maybe it's just if you grow up in sort of the privileged environs that you pick it up. But nevertheless, it's, it's easy for white kids, and they're, again, being taught now from fifth grade, if not before, that they are the bearers of white privilege. And so for them to feel like if they take to the barricades, they are writing the d centuries long wrongs of Western civilization and they're the first people to see these wrongs, that's a powerful uh, narcotic. It, it can be intoxicating to believe that. Yeah, yeah that I, I can see that, certainly. And yeah. for the minority students, uh, it's even more alluring uh, to be granted this now extremely privileged status of victimhood. There is a ruthlessly competitive hierarchy of victimhood, and there's always new heights being scaled. Uh, it turns out, you know, that being gay now on campus is so normalized that it's not, doesn't really earn you many victim points, and so now we have the whole trans phenomenon where they are at the top of the totem pole, but even that doesn't trump 
the, the racial multiculturalism uh, idea, which we have seen in Europe, which, where we have learned that multiculturalism trumps feminism as far as a, uh, a triumphant leftist ideology in two years ago on New Year's Eve across Europe, m heavily centered in Germany, but it w occurred in, s in France and Sweden. There were mass sexual assaults by Muslim men on the streets, uh, something that had never happened before in Germany or elsewhere. And rather than this leading to a rethinking of Germany or, or other countries' open borders ideology, because here actually was real rape culture. You know, this is a, a, a completely fanciful conceit that reigns on academic, on college campuses that we live in a rape culture. Well, you have what we saw there was actual people going up to strange women and sexually assaulting them in public. That's rape culture. What was the response? Nothing. The feminists in Europe were unwilling to say, we've got a problem with these misogynistic Muslim men. Instead, they blamed white patriarchy, and nothing changed in the immigration status quo. My, my question about that, that blaming the white patriarchy was, one, one good thing I read about that was, where were all the cases of the men who got beaten up for trying to protect those women? Why weren't any men getting into fights trying to defend the women who were being attacked? This is well, one, one question someone asked. Where, 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 were, where, were the, where were the men? If this is a patriarchy, aren't they supposed to be the ones in charge, in control? And, and so, and, anyway. Well, again, anyway. multiculturalism trumps, and, and they are not, if they had been seen fighting with Muslim men, uh, then they would have been bearers of Western colonial privilege. It's, uh, uh, there, there's no way out. Yeah. This is, this is a, you know, I, I don't want to end on a pessimistic note. Uh, and one, one might think that this problem of family breakdown is getting so severe. And it keeps climbing. Just a few years ago, it was in the mid-60s, now, I'm in the African American community, it's over 70%, yeah. and it keeps going up when you say 85% in the, in the inner cities. This is, this is beyond, beyond catastrophe uh, at this point. It's a great social experiment. It, it, it can't keep going, can it? Well, uh, I think it can. It's been going that way for the last three decades, and sadly, uh, it's the whites are, are following suit. I mean, the white out of wedlock birth rate now is 29%. Nationally, when you take all groups into account, it's 40%. If you want to understand the opioid academic, epidemic, if you want to understand males' withdrawal from the workforce, uh, look no farther, th for, farther than this. Look at the devalorization of males that is behind family breakdown and the fact that now, you know, the white underclass is, is, is mimicking black underclass behavior in the lack of, of marriage. And so if it keeps going, uh, it's going to be very hard to change if, you know, we, we here in New York, you know, de Blasio talked about two New Yorks and there's, Occasionally, you know, the part, some discourses, public discourses out there, talk about the inequality. But the, the very, very elite in this country still, they get married. I mean, they get divorced, they but they do get married. Uh, and that's going to be the biggest driver of inequality, is the fact that the elites marry and everybody else doesn't. And you're going to have kids in the non-marrying part that are unsocialized and unable to seize the opportunities that so far this country is still uh, providing. Heather McDonald, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for a great conversation.